All right, welcome back to this two-part lecture on the role of the United States during World War I. In the first part of the talk, I walked you along America's road to war, a fraught road, but we all know how that story went. After three years of staying out of the war, the United States, for various reasons, which we discussed and debated, chose to go to war through a vote of Congress on the 2nd of April, 1917. And my effort today is to try to walk you through uh, the American home front, the experience of the war in the United States during 1917 and 1918. World War I challenged basic assumptions about the role of the United States government in the economy and in the lives of the people. And it also challenged the role of the United States in the world. World War I, in many ways, was the turning point on which history failed to turn, uh, both in terms of political economy, and I'm going to make the argument that America became a democratic socialist state during World War I, and as we'll soon see coming out of World War I, uh, America reversed course towards, um, in many ways, uh, an unfettered capitalism in the 1920s, uh, that leading to the crash. Um, and uh, America chose to become integrated in you know, the, the, the global str struggle for dominance and become integrated in European affairs and uh, after World War I, America returned to what Warren G. Harding called normalcy and isolation, right? So those are kind of the arguments I'm going to be making throughout the talk, you know, both about political economy and about American isolationism. Um, we talked about peace and neutrality, and we talked about the road to war. So we have war as of the 2nd of April, 1917. And if you're going to have a war, you have to have a military. So the Selective Service Act was passed on the 18th of May in 1917. And after some real serious debate for six weeks, Congress authorized the registration and classification for military service uh, for all men between the ages of 21 and 30. And then just a few weeks later, um, we had 9.5 million men registered for service. Um, in 1918, we should note that the Manpower Act was passed, which extended the registration of uh, males from ages 18 to 45, which added another 13 or so million to the registration rolls. Um, now, of course, in August of 1918, the war was beginning to come to an end. So to some degree, the Manpower Act was a diplomatic maneuver designed to encourage the central powers to sign an armistice, right? The, the, the notion that there could be potentially 13 million more American boys coming to the Western Front um, was... Uh, a, a threat, a real threat. Yeah, to some degree, it was an empty threat. I mean, the notion of 45-year-olds going out to fight um, as someone who's soon to turn 45, uh, le <laughs> let me tell you, um, I'm not ready for the battlefield. Not even close. Um, as a man who could hardly get out of the bath. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that I'm ready for the battlefield. Um, but anyway, um, you have... Uh, a massive mobilization, right? Um, and of the 24 million who were registered, 2.8 million men served in the United States Army. Um, not all of them went overseas, right? This was challenged. The Manpower Act was challenged. The Selective Service Act was challenged in the Supreme Court because the, the Constitution gives Congress the power to, quote unquote, raise and support armies. But the Constitution per the 13th Amendment also prohibits involuntary servitude. And the First Amendment protects people's freedom of conscience. 
So this is a really interesting um, legal case that manifested in Arver versus the United States and the national government's prerogative, its legal right to conscript men against their will was upheld, right? So the first troops arrived in Europe in 1917. The first draftees uh, completed training on the 24th of, uh, of, of June. They show up in the, on the 4th of July. And yes, of course, that was very much architected as a matter of propaganda. American boys showing up on the 4th of July. Not that there's anything wrong with propaganda like that, but it's, you know, not not imprudent to call it what it is. And um, the American troops were under the command of General John J. Pershing. Pershing was, you know, a man among boys. He goes down in American history as one of the great generals. Um, and he was the commander of the American Expeditionary Force. And we should note that the American Expeditionary Force uh, was there to support British and French troops, but it did not integrate into the Allied forces. So American boys were not fighting alongside French and British forces. They were uh, f f fighting adjacent to them for the same cause. And the politics of that are interesting and problematic and sort of uh, beyond the purview of this lecture. Um, I should say, as a note, I'm not going to be talking about, you know, battles and, um, you know, American military strategy, not because it's not interesting, but because I'm limiting the scope of this particular lecture uh, to, to other matters. Yeah. So on the 27th of October, 1917, the first U.S. soldiers fired shots and the first casualties, first American casualties were on November 3rd. Remember, the war is over in November of 1918. Um, so what we're talking about is one year and two weeks of Americans in battled firing shots, okay? Um, and there was a lot of reporting uh, about the Western Front, going back home to the American people. One of the most celebrated um, reports was about the so-called Rainbow Coalition, uh, the Rainbow Division, which was a military division composed of men from all of the 48 contiguous states um, and three U.S. territories. So the notion is that American boys, North and South, East and West, poor and rich, German Americans, Irish Americans, French Americans, they're all fighting together. Asterisk. While African-Americans were subject to the draft, they fought in segregated troops. And as um, we will see, Woodrow Wilson was very uh, retrogressive in his views on race. He wasn't just a racist for his time. He was a racist for all time. He, in fact, resegregated the uh, federal um, government employees. So um, we'll, we'll get to that later. But um, the point is about the Rainbow Division, which was, you know, a, a sign of American solidarity and American unity. And we, the American people, are going to do this together. Um, and that is sort of a turning point. Yeah. And, um, and it's worth considering what the American people were fighting for. Remember a lot of soldiers, they were of German or Austrian ancestry, right? And so it was really important to establish the mission, to establish the purpose for the war, yeah? Especially for disaffected or confused conscripts. You know, there are a lot of people who all of a sudden, their numbers called, and they they don't think about Europe at all. They hadn't been following the war. They wanted nothing to do with it. And next thing you know, there's a letter in the mail or a knock at the door, and they got to put on a pair of boots, shave their heads, and go to war. You know, the majority of Americans were not thinking about European conflicts. And though it would be impossible to be unaware of World War I, it was perfectly possible to go about your daily lives without obsessing about or really even thinking about that war. And so it was necessary to establish 
a, a mission for the soldiers. And through the lens of Wilson's moral diplomacy, in January of 1918, Wilson announced his 14 points. Uh, these 14 points were his guidelines for setting up what we might call a new world order after the war, uh, uh, a world where we didn't have secret agreements, where we weren't always building up armaments, where global trade barriers were reduced, where there were freedom of the seas and where colonial claims were adjusted. Yeah. Belgium should be neutral. Alsace and Lorraine should be back in France's hands. Italy should be rearranged according to nationality. And that nationalism should reign supreme, right? Like the, the Serbians should have a land, right? Which is, of course, the, the Serbian story is so central to the causes of the war. And Poland should be independent. And not just independent, but with access to the sea. These are among Wilson's 14 points. And the 14th point is the one that he's perhaps most uh, remembered for, is the establishment of a League of Nations. And the League of Nations would be the space where leaders from different countries can come together to prevent tragedies like World War I from happening again. And though it is the case, as we will see in, in, in a forthcoming lecture, that the United States tragically and sort of strangely did not join the very League of Nations it proposed, uh, the League of Nations did help to do uh, some things to keep peace, although, as we know, that peace was hard to keep. Yeah. So Wilson's moral diplomacy and the idea of... Um, you know, crushing the savage Huns in this PowerPoint, you see this, um, you know, Prussian soldier with the pickle helmet and he's, you know, um, got the club of culture in his hand while he's, you know, going to do damage to this woman, this damsel in distress, right? This is why we're fighting. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to just say here that, you know, again, the U.S. was in the war for only a year. Um, in March of 1918, Russia signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, um, getting themselves out of the war, giving up some of their territory. Uh, Germany launched a spring counteroffensive in May of 1918, the beginning of the end of the war. And on October 9th, the German Kaiser abdicated uh, the throne. Uh, to a provisional government of Prince Max of Baden. Um, in early November, the German center crumbled. Austria surrendered. And on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, November 11th, 1918, an armistice was signed. Not a surrender. And it's important as we look towards World War II that the German people and the German government never surrendered. Troops never marched on Berlin. Right an armistice, a, a, a decision, like a mutual cessation agreement was signed. And Armistice Day was celebrated, um, you know, in, in, around the world um, uh, until World War II. And now we have, uh, you know, VE -E Day, Victory in Europe Day, and Veterans Day more, more broadly. Um, so, um, that's the war's end. The war was met with extraordinary costs. 126,000 Americans died uh, in a year. So you think about the Civil War. The Civil War was four years, you know, 550,000 dead, 120, 125,000 if it were a four year would be 500,000. So it was about as bloody as the Civil War. Plus you have 200,000 wounded and wounds can come in all shapes and, si and sizes. It could be blowing off one's finger. It could be losing both of, uh, of legs. It could be being blinded by gas. And um, not counted in the wounded number are American boys who came home with what they called uh, shell shock, what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. And there was indeed a generation of men who suffered mightily from military training and war. It is traumatic. And the stress of that trauma does not go away lightly. And of course, it wasn't only American 
men who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, this shell shock um, epidemic was global. Yeah. And tempted as I am to go into the, you know, causes of shell shock, suffice it to say that, you know, war is hell, as Walt Whitman said, and he couldn't have been more right. Um, the Entente lost 4.8 million, uh, 12 million wounded. The central powers were 3.2 million dead, 8.5 million wounded. And the American people spent $30 billion on this war plus untold costs in pensions. So it was insanely expensive psychologically, uh, economically, uh, and otherwise. Yeah. And a cost we could also note is America's so-called splendid isolation. Yeah. But three successive Republican presidents uh, supported by Republican majorities in both houses stemmed the tide of American integration into the global order. So Woodrow Wilson's dream of moral diplomacy, where the United States plays a central role in the League of Nations to help to create a world uh, of peace and order and stability, um, that very notion was repudiated by the opposition party in the United States, the Republican Party, you know, for, for better and for worse. And the fact of the matter is the Republicans were more popular. Their belief in American isolation, and thus, I suppose, their belief that that war was preposterous and America's participation in it to some degree was likewise preposterous, that won the day. Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, you know, isolation was their platform and they won, right? So that's the, 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 the turning point that I mentioned on which American history failed to turn. Um, not only did it take the market crash and the rise of fascism and World War II, it took two years of World War II from 1939 until 1941 until America on December 7th of 1941 because of the Pearl Harbor attack uh, became militarily involved in that war. And that was the turning point on which history turned when it came to American isolationism. And so since the American people were focused more on their home front, let's pivot our focus to the home front as well. Again, we're talking about the one year and two weeks at which America is at war. And during this time, things changed in America magnificently. America became a democratic socialist state. The conversion of industry to war production set important precedents for expanding federal power in a time of crisis. And this later guided federal efforts in the Great Depression and in World War II. Yeah. You know, this raises interesting questions that we're going to dive into in a forthcoming discussion about democratic socialism in the United States. When crises emerge, whether it's World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, some form of democratic socialism is the answer. But America continues to go back to some form of capitalism when the crisis subsides. Now, whether you think this is prudent or not uh, is uh, you know, a, a matter of opinion. Hopefully, it's well-researched opinion. But, but, but so it goes, right? You know, but it's very much the case that war socialism emerged, and it emerged in part through private-public partnerships. Right? One of these private-public partnerships was the Council of National Defense. The Council of National Defense was six cabinet members, and a se so like presidential cabinet members, and a, sem a seven-member advisory commission, right? private sector actors, that coordinated the manufacture of munitions and war materials. And this Council of National Defense, the CND, created the War Industries Board, 
Yeah. The War Industries Board uh, was directed by Bernard Baruch, who was, um, they called him the lone wolf of Wall Street. He was uh, a Jewish American, um, very successful, uh, became successful in St. Louis and became, you know, uh, the, the bull of bulls in, in Wall Street um, in, in, in the, the aughts and the teens. And Baruch was a household name uh, in, in, in New York socialite life, and he oversaw all aspects of industrial production and distribution. Uh, he provided incentives for manufacturers to rejigger their, uh, ma their, their manufacturing plants, their industry for war-related materials, right? So it's like, you know, you make you know, women's hose. Well, now you're making, we are going to, we are going to pay you this much to make men's pants for, for war. You know, um, you make sports shoes. We're going to pay you this much per pair of boots and we'll buy all of those boots. And so shoe factories became boot factories and, you know, car factories became tank factories. And the and the companies were proud to do it. They were proud to engage in the socialist experiment of, you know, government directed production and consumption. Partly because they could be guaranteed a particular profit, and the federal government was likely to make good on the contracts that they had signed. Partly because they believed in the cause. They believed that the war needed to be ended, and that America had a special role in so doing. And so antitrust laws were suspended, industries cooperated, and the government oversaw that. That's socialism. The War Industries Board director, Bernard Baruch, had almost dictatorial powers to allocate materials, to fix prices. Price fixing is socialism. Coordinating purchasing is socialism. And a new cooperation between military and civilian agencies emerged in what later be called, became called the military and industrial complex. The term, though it existed around this time, uh, was not in popular use until uh, after World War II, when the military industrial complex became um, criticized by um, the anti Cold Warriors. Right? So the War Industries Board is government-directed, government-coordinated industry. It's socialism. Socialism through private-public partnerships. Yeah. The um, Lever Food and Fuel Control Act of 1917, named after Asbury Lever, who was a, a, a South Carolinian uh, Democrat, South Carolinian, um, it was chaired by Herbert Hoover, who we'll soon learn about. Hoover was one of those, you know, real rags to riches story. He became a self-made millionaire and um, he was a, a mining tycoon and he took the role. Like he, he gave up, you know, making millions and millions. I would say he gave it up, but he sort of put his directorship of his businesses on hold to work for the government because he wanted, he believed in America. He wanted America to win. He was also aspirational politically um, and his aspirations worked out. But the Lever Food and Fuel Control Act set the price of farm products. This was the populist's dream. If you recall in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the farmers wanted this type of socialist protection. This is what William Jennings Bryan was fighting for. What Mary Ellen Lease was fighting for. Raise less corn and more hell, she said, to have farm product prices set by the farmers themselves. Um, and now it's the government setting the price of farm products, right? Because in order to feed the boys, be they American or French or British, you know, the uh, comparatively unpredictable competition that capitalism demands was not in order, right? Like capitalism wasn't going to work. Competition between companies wasn't going to work. Competition between farmers wasn't going to work. Cooperation was necessary. Socialism was necessary. to win the war.
Now, unlike in World War II, in World War I, the U.S. didn't go so far into socialism as to ration food. Instead, the United States government encouraged voluntary food conservation for the war. You know, you would have meatless Tuesdays or wheatless Wednesdays, you know, gasless Sundays, lightless nights. Turn off your lights at night. And the American people, fueled with propaganda to encourage them to go meatless on Tuesday and wheatless on Wednesday, they did it. They did it. And it's important for us to all realize that these people were Americans too. I know that in my audience of like, you know, sort of like progressive, you know, Berlin, liberal, German, American, American kids, you're maybe less inclined to see Americans as sharing, caring people who are willing to self-sacrifice. That's not the image the news gives you. But let me tell you, that story of cooperation and sacrifice is what made America the strongest power in the history of the world. And while that might be a bit of an oversimplification, surely there's truth to that. And it's important for me for you to see that the American people, when they're communicated with, you know, when there's a clear mission, when they can feel like they have trust in their leaders, they'll give up meat on Tuesday. To give up meat in October if the right person is telling them to do it. Right? So it's worth kind of meditating on that historical reality. There's nothing, there's nothing fundamental. There's nothing at the core of the American that makes them unwilling or unable to sacrifice. Indeed, it is self-sacrifice, asking what you can do for your country. That defines a lot of American successes going back to World War I. Because of these sacrifices, food exports rose from 12 to 18 million tons in a year. And guess what? Farmers made more money, 30% more from 1915 to 1918. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that agrarian socialism would have worked forever. But it sure worked then. Remember, the farmers wanted the railroads to be administrated by the federal government. One of the grievances that the farmers had was that the railroad oligopoly was suffocating them. Well, in December of 1917, the federal government, a day late and a dollar short for the populists, yeah, um, the federal government got involved in um, eff effectively nationalizing the railroads during the war. The Secretary of the Treasury, William Gibbs McAdoo, McAdoo is always a fun name to say, he was the Director General of the Railroads and he pooled all of the railroad equipment, he centralized purchasing, standardized accounting, and he raised wages and rates for railroad workers. The railroads became a socialist enterprise run by the US Rail Administration and the Rail Control Act of 1918. Yeah. The government basically subsidized the railroads. They said, this is how much you're going to charge per mile. Yeah. These are the hours you're going to run. And it helped to win the war. And last but surely not least, in fact, as I'm thinking about it, perhaps this should have been first. I only put it last because chronologically it's last. The War Labor Board was established in April of 19. 18, which was co-chaired by William Howard Taft, the former president, and Frank Walsh. And Taft and Walsh oversaw 1,200 arbitration cases during six months of World War I. They stopped strikes and slowdowns and lockouts. They reduced the antagonism between labor and capital. We're talking about arbitrating three to four cases a day, a huge federal bureaucracy going out there and be like, these people at the, you know, the, the, the tire factory, they want to go on strike because they're being forced to, you know, they, they're supposed to work 10 hours a day, but their boss is keeping them there for 11 or 12. Let's send someone out there, you know, talk to the union reps, talk to the factory owners. Let's, we, we, we need tires. We can't go another day without tires. We can't go another way another day without canned beans. You know, the people at the Heinz plant 
the McCain beans, they're on strike. The workers are sick of, uh, they, they say it's too hot in the factory. They can't breathe. There's too much smoke. Get someone out there, arbitrate the case, get it done. And the U.S. government respected labor, organized labor on equal footing. And that's socialist in its worldview. The notion that labor has dignity, the notion that the factory worker is as important as the CEO or the CFO or the owner. Yeah. And with these arbitrations in mind, the War Labor Policies Board was established in June of 1918. And this was headed by the, uh, the Austrian, another Jewish guy, Felix Frankfurter. Um, and this set wage and, wage and hour standards for industry. This is the federal government saying, this is how many hours a factory worker can work. They, if they work more than this, it's dangerous. They work less than this, they can't afford it. Here's what they're gonna get paid, yeah? And if they ask for more, there has to be a collective bargaining regime to create communication between the, um, uh, the workers and the bosses. That's what the progressives were fighting for, right? That's what the populists were fighting for. It was progressivism plus populism plus some socialist impulses that defined economic life on the American home front. But it's important also to talk about the cultural facets of the home front. And to do that, we have to begin with the Committee on Public Information, uh, often called the Creole Committee, uh, named after the chairman of the Committee on Public Information, George Creel. Um, he was a uh, nationally recognized journalist um, and he worked alongside the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Navy, and they saturated the nation with propaganda, propaganda portraying the American effort as a crusade for democracy against savage Huns, bloodthirsty, savage Germans and Austrians who were hell-bent on global domination. They lied. They manipulated. They sought to amplify fears of a German invasion, some of which, you know, turned out to not be unsubstantiated. Um, they printed anti-German pamphlets. They sent out 75,000 so-called four minute men. Yeah. And, and the four minute men would they get on the train every at every train stop, they'd give a four minute speech, four minute men, about how the war came to America and why we fight and why we should sacrifice and why we should have, you know, gasless Sundays and meatless Tuesdays and lightless nights. Why Americans have to sacrifice and why it's worth it. And sure, it was all just propaganda, but would you mind if there were, you know, 75,000 four minute men to get Americans to recycle? Propaganda, would you mind? I, I don't know that I would, you know, to get us to carpool or to trade in our SUVs and buy electric vehicles, just as examples. There were 7 million copies of this pamphlet that I show here, How the War Came to America. And while it is not entirely, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, laden with empirical truths, it seeks to inspire and motivate the American to support the war effort. And some of the Creole Committee's practices were, shall we say, overzealous. They persecuted war opponents, including red-blooded patriotic Americans like Fighting Bob LaFollette and Eugene Debs uh, and Jane Addams. Um, the committee encouraged dropping German language instruction in high schools. German used to be one of the um, more popular languages uh, among American high school students, but um, the committee said you should drop those. And then the committee encouraged removing the use of German words in you know the, the English language, words like kindergarten and the dachshund, they call dachshunds liberty pups. Yeah, 
Um, and they, by the way, they called uh, German measles liberty measles, which, first of all, you know, like they call them German measles the way that some people would want to call it the um, Chinese, call Corona, Corona the, the, the Chinese virus. Um, but also, like, if you're really against the Germans, I would just think, you know, keep calling them German measles. I mean, if you want to associate them with, you know, brutal killers, just... Anyway, um, but the committee did that, but it, it was really the tone that that administration set, the tone that the leadership set, that created a culture in America where um, regular American people became belligerent towards Germans and Austrians or people who they thought might be German or Austrian, right? German Americans and Germans living in America were persecuted and forcing many of them to Americanize their 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 names and their ways of life. A lot of people became who were Schmidt became Smith. There was an ordinance in Cincinnati which removed pretzels from saloons instead of having pretzels, which were associated with, you know, Germans and Austrians. Um, they would have peanuts. In Pittsburgh, there was a city ordinance prohibiting the playing of Beethoven in public. <laughs> right. And there were book burnings. Often in American cities, burning of German books by German authors and Austrian authors. You know, German and Austrian sheet music was burned in the streets of Chicago. So there's what the Committee of Public Information did, and some of it was, you know, not exactly above board, but it's the tone that they set, this culture of belligerence that gave Americans who were already, some of them, xenophobic or somehow anti-German, um, it, it, it gave them the green light to act on their worst instincts, if that sounds familiar. But the Committee on Public Information didn't have a, um, you know, a hegemony on American overreach. In June of 1917, the Espionage Act was passed. The Espionage Act forbade actions among the American people, which would obstruct recruitment efforts or promote insubordination in the military. In other words, you can't stand out in front of a recruiting office and say, don't, you know, don't, don't enlist, burn your draft card, because all you're doing is supporting the British and their, um, their empire. Yeah. Let's not ally with the British and the French. The British and French are doing dastardly deeds around the world. Yeah. If you do that, you could be charged with the Espionage Act. If you are, um, if you're in the military and you try to get, you know, your fellow soldiers to lay down their arms, you can be charged with the Espionage Act. If you are sending out materials, uh, let's say you are printing you know, anti-war materials or just sort of like materials unfriendly to the war, the Postmaster General was allowed to remove your, um, um, your your right to send through the U.S. Post. By the way, the New York Times lost its mailing privileges, like the New York Times, you know. And in Schenck versus the United States in March of 1919, the Supreme Court um, upheld the Espionage Act because, as they say, um, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Yelling fire you know, on your driveway is fine, but you can't yell fire in a crowded theater because that presents a clear and present danger. And when your speech presents a clear and present danger, in this case, a danger to the U.S. war effort, then your free speech ends. This Espionage Act was doubled down on via the Sedition Act of May of 1918. And this broadened the Espionage Act. It made it a crime to speak against the purchase of war bonds. You can't say don't buy war bonds. You go to jail for um, refuting the legitimacy of buying war bonds. It became illegal, and I'm quoting here, to willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the United States government or the United States Armed Forces. You, it also became a crime to, quote, willfully urge, incite, or advocate any curtailment of production of things necessary to the prosecution of the war. 
So you can't stand out of a fa- out, outside of a munitions factory and say, you know, this is wrong. Stop production. You can't even say it. You're going to jail. And the the Sedition Act did differentiate, you know, between an anti-war statement and a statement that might just be critical of American policy. Eugene Debs, the the great socialist, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for giving an anti-war speech. He wasn't being violent. He was standing on a soapbox and speaking his mind. Uh, Incidentally, he won a million votes from prison in 1920. Victor Berger, uh, the, the, the great progressive Wisconsinite, You know, a really like a household name, a a hero of his era. He was refused seating in the House of Representatives because he was indicted under the Espionage Act. They sentenced him to 20 years in prison. This was overturned uh, because it was a total sham trial. And then there was a question like, can a felon serve in the House? Well, while that might be like a question, can, can can a convicted felon be in the House of Representatives? He was only a felon because it was a, it was a sham trial. And the fact is, he was a Jew and a socialist and an Austrian, and that's why he was refused seating in the House of Representatives. By the way, he was reelected by the people in Wisconsin when he was being refused that seat, to give you a sense of how popular he was. Yeah. And then there was the case of Abrams versus the United States, which challenged the Sedition Act in the way that the Schenck case challenged the Espionage Act. Yeah. And in this case, there was a a Russian born Jewish anarchist who was dropping leaflets out of a a hat factory, you know, third floor of a hat factory. And the leaflets basically said that, you know, the U.S. um, refusal to recognize the Russian Revolution um, was wrong. And also there was another leaflet that called against a general strike of American intervention in the war. This is a dude who's dropping leaflets out of a hat factory. And he gets arrested because of the Sedition Act. And um, yeah, uh, the, 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 it was upheld. Uh, his conviction was upheld. But Oliver Wendell Holmes and Justice Brandeis dissented saying um, that, you know, a silly leaflet published by some unknown isn't really a danger. But I got to tell you, it's really important. The Sedition Act is still part of the U.S. Code. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, during the early years of the Cold War, were persecuted under the Sedition Act. Daniel Ellsberg, during the Vietnam War, was prosecuted under, persecuted, I'd say, under the Sedition Act. Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, all face Sedition Act charges. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the reason that the Espionage and Sedition Acts were deemed to be necessary by the Wilson administration was because um, people were standing up against financing the war. They were trying to get people to not buy liberty bonds. And um, you have the Liberty Loan Act uh, and the War Revenue Act, which raised a ton of money to fund the war. $21.5 $21.5 billion were raised by the American people. American people went to work in the factories. They went to work on the farms. And with every extra penny they had, they bought war bonds. They bought war bonds because they uh, supported the war effort. Yeah. In 1913, the total federal expenditures were only $970 million, right? So the, the government in 1913 spent a billion dollars. That was it. That was the whole budget. In 1918, the government raised $21.5 billion in bonds alone. Now, the war cost was about $30 billion, And the war bonds paid for about two-thirds of the war. Yeah. And the other $10 billion was paid for by taxes, socialist taxation. Taxes were raised through the war. And in all of my reading, I have never found an example of people who protested taxes. Yeah. 
Now, taxes were low, as low as 4% for the, the lowest bracket, but the highest um, earners paid 77% of their income in taxes. If you made, say, $100,000 in 1918, you, you gave 77% of that up. You were left with 23000 if you made 100000 That's a lot of money still in those days. But like, Americans were proud to pay those taxes. There's nothing about Americans that makes them allergic to taxes per se. They just have to be led to believe that their money is going to a good place. Yeah. And Americans today don't, they don't believe that. Yeah. Um, I just want to give a, a note as we wrap up here, because uh, I would be remiss in not doing so, uh, especially because I brought it up earlier about the impact of World War II on African Americans and women. Uh, there was a real debate in the Black communities about whether they should be fighting in this war. Um, the draft law was applied equally to both races, but not to um, men and women. As I said, troops were segregated. There were women, black women in the Red Cross, um, but there was a debate in particular between W.E.B. Du Bois on the left, and it is indeed Du Bois, it's not a French pronunciation, and William Monroe Trotter, but also Marcus Garvey. Um, Trotter was the founder of the Niagara Movement, he studied at Harvard. Uh, he actually got kicked out of the Oval Office by Woodrow Wilson uh, when he demanded integrated troops. Um, uh, du Bois was for Black participation in the war. He wrote an editorial in the Crisis Magazine, a Chicago African American magazine, and an essay called "Close Closing Ranks," I think it was called, or "Close the Ranks," something like that. And he um, he argued that for African Americans to um, enjoy the fruits of America, they have to make the sacrifices that white Americans have to make in times of war. Um, and uh, not all Black people agreed with that. You know, why should Americans? Why should African Americans go fight for you know truth, justice in the American way to support British and French, you know, governments who are repressing black people around the world? It's a real question. Yeah. Um, and as far as women are concerned, you know, you have women who found unprecedented industrial job opportunities, um, but it only lasted for a year and the, the men came home and the men got their jobs back. It wasn't really like World War II where women went to the factories en masse. Um, the World War II story was very different for the role of women. But because of the sacrifices that women made during World War I, um, because of movements that they engaged in to, for example, uh, halt the spread of prostitution and um, and to stop venereal disease uh, you know, uh, and the things that men were doing overseas, yada, yada. Um, um, and because they stayed active and they helped to promote the propaganda, um, women got the right to vote in um, 1920. And in 1919, women got what they had wanted, what a lot of women had wanted for a long time, which was prohibition of alcohol. Yeah. Um, we will talk in another lecture about domestic issues after the war, but it's worth pointing out here, um, sort of as um, as a transition a cliffhanger of sorts, that you know getting into war requires this you know robust nationwide effort. It fundamentally changes the content and tone of politics, and it's worth thinking about how getting out of war poses equally vexing challenges to governments. And the American government, in an effort to demobilize, faced a recession. They faced labor problems, which led to the first Red Scare, not to be confused with the Red Scare after World War II. Um, and so it's worth reflecting on this year in American history. And while it was, like I said, the turning point on which history failed to turn. 1917, 1918 is a fascinating case study in the politics of possibility in American political economy. The politics of possibility. And with that as something to think about, I wish you health, health, 
and wellness. And I hope to see you soon.